is this is a very interesting young lawyer working for Ernst and Young in Ho, Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah, in Ho Chi Minh City, um, and you've been there for nine years. Eight. Eight years. Eight years. Okay, so I'm delighted that you made the time to come here because what Tao writes about studying law in the old building was really depressing. <laughs> And I wanted her to see really the new sorry. building. Um, I was so scared. I wanted to know. No, actually, you weren't. I wasn't. I was honest. But, and I'm really pleased we've got some teachers here too, um, because I think what you have to say is intrinsically interesting in terms of the story. Um, most of you who are here probably don't need to know too much about the um, what what your family fled, where your family fled from, and so on. But actually, it's so interesting. We're going to talk about it anyway. Um, but this is a story that really takes you classically through the refugee experience, um, the programs Australia had to bring refugees to Australia. But what happened after that? What was it like to land in Sydney and to make your way and to become one of the elite of Australian society in one generation? Mm. Um, I think it's interesting because law is a classic vehicle for that transition from um, from poverty through to unimaginable wealth really when you mm. think about it um, my own husband went through that too I was explaining this to Tao before but so what I thought I've, I haven't done this type of literary thing before <laughs> I'm not a very You're doing really person. well Mary <laughs> I'm usually more interested in conveying facts <laughs> usually pretty depressing facts about refugees um, so I'm going to have a go at doing the literary introduction in a interview. <laughs> ben did a better job the other day. Um, uh, I thought we'd do it in three parts. We'll go through through your parents' story, through uh, the settlement mm. in Australia, um, and then through your story too, mm. because it's particularly relevant to us. And I want to try and reflect on your experience here and what you think we could have done mm to make it easier for someone from a dramatically different background mm. um, to to be supported and, mm. and accepted. We obviously didn't do that badly mm. um, in that you've done so well. Back then. But then everybody's going to claim you as, well, see, that's mm. what happens if, if, if you fail, no one's your friend. And if, yes, if exactly. you succeed, everybody think, says that's because of me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, isn't it a delight? Um, the other thing that's just hilarious about this book is that Tao has actually named her boyfriends <laughs> all the way through. So my last question was going to be, so, <laughs> Brendan, <laughs> um, no, Tony is her husband now. <laughs> He's not mentioned in the book. That's so, book two. Mm, yeah, book two has no. Tony in it. <laughs> so I just thought I'd get that out of the way straight away. Uh, that's particularly um, a gesture of great bravery, I think, to, to name your boyfriends. But, I've changed the names, Mary. Ah, oh, not their real names. I didn't names. want to tell you, but you know, because you were really excited about it, and I just, uh, but I had to tell you at some point. It's not their oh, real names, but they are there. Name. They know who they are. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh, that's what I do in my reports. Not their real name. Okay. I really am called Mary Croc. So. <laughs> I don't know Mary about that. Don't you? There must be another name. Well, I actually get called a lot of things from RJ to mm. hey you. Mm. Um, anyway, so, mm. Tao. Okay, well, um, first of all, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming um, and especially to Mary to, for organising this really at the last minute. Um, I, I shot her an email and she, in her classic, passionate, swift style, she just put this all together so so thank you so much Mary um, look I think probably as Mary said I wanted to share a little bit about um, the journey of, of my parents uh, coming uh, to the camps why they fled um, and it's the story of so many other refugees and uh, also migrants um, and but so you you probably all know that at the end of the war of the Vietnam War in 1975, when the gov when the country was unified under communism, a lot of the Southern Republican uh, government officials and military were persecuted. So my father, who was a banker uh, before conscription in the South, 
um, he was conscripted to be a lieutenant in the Southern Republican Army and fighting alongside the Allied forces, the Australians, the Americans. So when the uh, war ended, he was sent to a re-education camp for about two years. On my mother's side, we, have, uh, we had people in the Navy, um, in the police, also in the military. And the more high ranking that you were, obviously the more re-education that you needed. So my uncles were in for about 10 years. Um, when my dad left, um, he, he was sent to um, basically work on the farms and pepper farms and became, everyone became a labourer and all of the assets were redistributed and, and taken by the state. And on my mother's side, um, it was... And he wouldn't talk about his experience in, in the re-education No, camp. no, he, he actually, he, he, he can't. And the only way I was able to find out about the re-education at camp experience was um, talking to a whole bunch of other people. So on some of my visits to Vietnam, um, I met with cyclo drivers, motorbike taxi drivers who were formerly decorated men in the South who weren't lucky enough to flee and settle in the West. So they told me um, that in the camps every day they had to stand up and say that they were a traitor to their country by siding with the Americans. They were starving, they ate insects for protein. Um, there was one doctor, um, he, he was one of the very few doctors that was associated with the Allied forces that was still able to get a government job after the war fell. And when he told me he was in the re-education camp, he said we were so, we were just literally starving and we had to clear the land for development. And occasionally a train would pass in the mountains and these passengers would throw down bits of scrap food, um, some bits of cooked cassava or, or other roots. And, they, and these men who were doctors and you know, bankers and, and very educated people had to just scramble and then they were smashing the food into their mouths like as if they were just these, these hungry predators and the indignity of, of all of that. So when, um, my, my, when on my mother's side, all of the boys had been sent to re-education camps. So there were only three girls left and the youngest boy was 15. And uh, my aunt tells me, not my mother, it was my aunt that recalls that they were so poor that the three sisters shared one pair of pants and they couldn't leave the house at the same time because they had no pants to wear. And the pants were just patched again and again and again, this piece of rag. Um, shortly after my dad left the camp, he married my mother and it was just a swift union. She was educated, he wasn't disabled, that's it, they got married. Um, and uh, rumour had it that uh, he had to demine landmines. So they were looking for him and that's when they decided to, to leave in the middle of the night in December 1979. Mm. But they must have been... Um, so 1979, uh, that... I'm going to, to get mm. Tao to, to show you on the map exactly where her family came from and to, to show you where they went, but... Um, they must have been planning for some time to leave, though, um, because uh, your so the party went, that eventually left was mm. your mother, your father, your youngest, your oldest brother, who was born twelve months, twelve months as a baby. Uh, so he was a ba baby, baby yeah. in arms. Yeah. Um, your mother's brother, fifteen years old, who was fifteen years old, which was really sad. Yeah. And who was the and my and, my cousin on my and dad's your cousin side on your father's side. Yeah, who was also side. fifteen. Right. So you had two fifteen-year-olds yeah. in the group. Yeah. My goodness. But the one for the cousin, um, he had in the classic refugee story type, he had um, gold sewn into his clothes, uh, which he managed to actually secrete all the way through. Yeah. Um, and your parents had some jewellery that they had kept. Yeah. As well. Yeah. But still, um, you know, had, again, the classic terrible experience with the smugglers. Mm. So do you want to just show mm. on, yeah. on the map here? Yeah, maybe. So, so maybe um, a bit of context that you, you probably all knew about the boat people that left Vietnam. Um, but we didn't go by boat and we actually went by foot across Vietnam, across, Thai, across Cambodia and into Thailand. And um, just to let you know some statistics about this that I was doing some very brief research around the book. Um, for the boat people that left, 
between one in three and one in two people died. So you either had a 30% or 50% chance of survival. But and for at, at one particular point in time, actually 70% of the people fleeing into the South China Seas were being picked up and plundered, murdered uh, mm. by, by pirates. pirates. So yeah. at this particular time, um, there were more people dying at sea than possibly at any other time in human history yeah. Um, yeah. as a result of, of a mm. direct exodus. They were going all over the world. We had them make landfall in Australia. About 1,000 made it to Australia. But the vast majority went to Malaysia. Hong Kong, Malaysia and Indonesia. And yeah. that's where they set up camps. In mm. fact, I saw the there's still <coughs> residues of the Thai camps in Thailand. Mm. In 2005, mm. um, I worked with your co friend, um, who was a year younger than you, I think, mm. Lisa Nguyen. We, yeah. we went and tried to resolve a caseload from the Vietnam War still living in in Thailand, mm. including a, a, a man who had been had a leg amputated at, at, at his um, thigh, high thigh, who stood to attention and saluted me when I came in. <sighs> Just amazing, amazing. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. So then the people that had gone the same route that we left, um, nine out of 10 died. Yeah. So well, we where. had a 10% chance of survival and um, one Cyclo driver that I met, he said he tried n eight times to leave. And on the ninth time, all of his friends were shot dead. So he, he didn't go any, he didn't try again. So this is the way that, that we <coughs> went. And also at the time, just sorry, sorry Mary, yeah. all the, most of the people that left were young single males. And we had a pack, including a 12 month old baby. So, the f so it's, I mean, the miracles, the miracles that I'm sitting here with you yeah. is incredible. Yeah. So we, so um, maybe I can just move up. So this is Ho Chi Minh City and we were, we are from a province called Tainan province around here near the border. But we, so if I, so essentially we went through here across to Phnom Penh to Battambang and then into around here Poi Pet and this po and then into into uh, Thailand yeah and this area the Poi Pet border was the most heavily mined per square kilometer yeah. area in the entire world mm. um, and so if I can zoom in just to show you so this is 1979 yeah um, you know what was happening in 1979? Well, in fact, it was um, yeah. at the height of, of the, the Cambodian genocide. So this family went from really out of the frying pan into an incredible fire. So it's just, it's extraordinary that they lived. Okay, so uh, if you... So there's, uh, you can see there's Thainan around there. And uh, we went through Spai Ri and then to Phnom Penh. And it was through foot and bicycles and, and uh, a, a hand pump sort of trolley on a track yeah. that the French built in Cambodia. And this is rough country. It still is today. I think one of the most dangerous things I ever did in, in my research life was to take um, a car from Phnom Penh to Siem Reap in Vietnam, uh, in um, Cambodia, and the roads were just so crude and everybody just drove down the middle. So you would come straight on and then at the last minute people would diverge. And and that was that's years now, later when there's roads. That's 2005. So. so there was one point towards the, the end of the journey. Um, and in order to disguise um, the, the pack from the Khmer Rouge, which had now been pushed towards the border of Cambodia and Thailand, because the new Vietnamese communist government intervened when the world didn't, basically Rwanda, if you remember. Everyone was saying, look, all these you know, killings is going on and no one was doing anything. So Vietnam, the neighbor, just had peace time for a few years. They said, well, three million, how many millions of people are being killed? Let's go in. 
So they went in, um, in towards 1978 and 1979, but the Khmer Rouge was sort of slowly being pushed towards the border, which is where my parents were heading towards. So they were all on bicycles, separated about a, by a kilometre, um, and, and each bicycle w was a p people smuggler that had been paid by a head smuggler in Vietnam who was a friend of our grandfather's. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why my parents just decided to go was because they really trusted this man and it was like he was their godfather. But apparently they, the smugglers throughout the journey said that the man didn't pay them. So then they started to abandon us one by one in the jungles. And, um, and at one checkpoint, uh, it was a Khmer Rouge checkpoint. So they would just appear. And then, you know, they had guns and, and they could just kill you on the spot. And this was a time when they were smashing babies against the heads of tre against trees to save bullets. And they were just, they were just killing people. Mm. Um, and my dad said to the smuggler, he indicated, I can't see my mom I can't see my wife anymore mm. and he's like if we stop we're gonna die so we just have to go um mm. so he left and then he had just abandoned my dad in the middle of the jungle and my dad looked around and it was a sparse jungle there wasn't enough foliage and he said you can't even suck on the leaves for 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 to nourish yourself because it was just all blown to bits and there were severed heads and he saw one image where it, there was a sign written in blood and he didn't know what that word meant mm. until he got to the camps and then the Cambodian people told him that word meant Vietnamese. Yeah. So whoever did that, they were sent a warning signal that the Vietnamese Wonderful. were not welcome in their country. Mm. And my mother went through and she saw the fresh killing fields that weren't bones anymore. It was severed hands, it was limbs mm. and there was this one particular man who honestly she said that if it wasn't for him she probably would have been dead and he was transporting her he made her look as though she was this elegant woman from Batambang the, the styled in a Batambang style so she had a very nice hat on and it, it he he wanted to make her look like she was his wife and he was mm. a merchant trader because that was the route that they were taking mm. and then he he put this beautiful hat on and the 12 month old baby, my brother, was wrapped tightly in a sarong to make him look as though he was good. And to this day, my mother says, it is it is honestly a miracle that Van didn't cry. Mm -hmm. At the checkpoint with the Khmer Rouge, this little baby, you know, throughout the whole journey, he was just, my dad remembered looking at his eyes and he had this, this stark sense of knowing as a, as a 12 month old baby and my father was freaked out he said that's an omen that we're not going to make it because there's, there's something bizarre about this 12 month old baby not crying and just sort of knowing and this Cambodian man who spoke French he put on a magic black magic spell around my mother and my mother recognized it from Vietnam and it was a square with some writing on it and he put it around her neck and it was supposed to make her invisible to protect her so he passed through, um, the Khmer Rouge told her to get off the bicycle, so she just got off and, and then they just exchanged some words and she got back on and hold the, held the baby as though it was some goods. They just went on and kept going. Um, meanwhile, her younger brother, the 15 year old, um, he was stopped, but he didn't make it. And uh, he, he was, was by tall. that stage very, very injured. He, he was had, injured. He had yeah. these insects or scorpions that had bitten his legs in the jungle, so he was limping and it was really infected. Mm -hmm. And because he was also very tall for his age, they thought that he was some sort of soldier or mm -hmm. military person. So then they, so my cousin saw him be bli blindfolded. Um, and at that point. He him to death. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah I, I was tempted to read you that section of the book, although. That's exactly the section that they extracted in the um, Australian magazine on the weekend. Mm. Um, but just to show you how beautifully this young lady writes, it's, um, it's very, very moving. Mm. So um, anyway, they, they made it to the camps and uh, Nick, I think, asked me how, 
how did you come to Australia? Mm. And that reminded me that you were actually born in the camp yeah. before you came. Mm. And so interestingly, Tao's mum, the first child was born one month early. You were born two months early in a refugee camp and you survived. I mean, the miracles that just mount up in your life are quite extraordinary. Um, and then Vin, who's taking the photos today, was born three months early. And lived in an incubator in Bankstown Hospital yeah. for three months. Well, <laughs> and here he yeah. is. Well, Go, Vin. <laughs> and you know, you know, Vin, my husband, Ron McCallum, was also born in um, three months early. He was put in an incubator at a time when they didn't understand how closely you have to regulate the oxygen. That's why he's blind. So you're actually a beneficiary from a the technology of um, that came from post World War Two, mm. the space space technology, um, and be the learning that they made around about the, uh, Ron's birth, which is 1948-50, about careful regulation of the oxygen so mm. you don't end up blind mm. or brain brain wow. damaged wow. so there you go in fact that's not the only similarity he's very sorry he can't be here today because uh, Ron came from just as poor a background in, in any way in, in some ways but thoroughly Australian uh, fifth sixth generation Australian um, what I want to take you to now is what happened and you know she de Tao describes very not, very well um, the hardships of the camps in Thailand. Uh, the family actually went through two camps, one that was very dangerous, um, and again, it's a miracle that mm. your mum wasn't raped and yeah. you know it was yeah. it was a murderous place and a murderous time. Yes. Um, the second camp is the camp where people were resettled from to either Canada, which is where Tony's family ended up. And Tao's family, of course, ended up in Australia. Um, came in through Perth, where I was born. Good old semi Sandover. Go, Go Perth. Um, and then you came to Sydney. Yeah, Villawood. And well, Villawood now, of course, it's it used to be a reception centre. Now it is a detention centre. Yes. Um, in those days, you would have been housed in a series of Nissan huts out there. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. Um, but what I want you to talk about a little bit is what happened after that, um, how your parents actually made a life in Australia because I think this is a very interesting part of Australia's history. Um, it's a time when we, had, we received 27,000 unaccompanied children from Vietnam. Did you know that? Mm. We took in 180,000 odd over the period from... 1978 through to 1982, 83. Mm. When I was in Melbourne, as a young law student, I cut my teeth um, teaching English without any success whatsoever to a Vietnamese family. Every single week, I would be relegated to try and teach the grandmother <laughs> and we'd go back to the ABCs and dog and cat and we'd just say, ah, oh, let's have some pho. <laughs> they can cook. So it's a very interesting time because there was a lot of goodwill in, a, in the Australian community, mm. but perhaps not such brilliant structures in place to settle people properly. Yeah. And so there are a couple of horrendous things that happened, particularly to your mum. Yeah. Um, but just the story that you tell about your mum reverting to her natural instincts of a extreme generosity, yeah. which worked um, against well her. and against her, unfortunately, yeah. but also just the the real desire to settle and make sure that the kids did well in school and not to take back. Um, so I think that's something that uh, I, I don't know if I can generalise, but I've met a lot of Viet uh, of um, particularly Vietnamese families who were just too proud to go on welfare mm -hmm. and they just did anything and everything to try and make a buck yeah um so perhaps you could talk a little mm. bit about that connection with ron there is that that <coughs> tao's mum uh, reverted to outwork uh, piece work at home sewing clothes and that's exactly that's that was ron's lullaby as well that's he went to sleep listening to his mother sewing at night that's incredible yeah, yeah. and having to make having to make contracts yeah um 
Yeah. And tell him about the teeth because Ron lost all of his as well. Oh, what's mm. with What's that? with the teeth? I know. Yeah. Oh. So if that, some things I think have improved. Yeah. You know. um, my goodness. Well, when we got to Australia, um, we were processed and accepted and we got onto a Qantas plane. This was in 1979 in, uh, uh, no, 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 sorry, 1980 in November. 13th of November. 13th of November, 1980. (laughs) We arrived. Yeah. I read the class. Yeah. And, um, and, and (coughs) there were four other Vietnamese families on the plane and uh, they just had their clothes. They had no paperwork, Mm -hmm. nothing with them. So you really were at, towards the beginning of what became... A very big program the way of, of resettlement yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I had diarrhea apparently that day I came down with diarrhea and uh, my mother was so afraid that if they found out then I then they would just not let us go and after all this time so she again wrapped me in this sarong um, and the sarong was from the Cambodian the French speaking Cambodian man and he had given that to my mother and I was literally born into that sarong and I grew up with that sarong having bad haircuts. My mother cut my hair. Um, and we, I still have that sarong to this day. And it really is a symbol of the kindness of strangers. And that, that's, the, that's how we, we ended up surviving. So I'm wrapped up in the sarong. And again, this bizarre miracle that this three-month-old baby wrapped tightly in poo um, just didn't cry throughout the journey and you know there was this this knowing and still my my two-year-old brother at the time Van he was also very still and then that when they served the food my parents thought that we had to pay for it so they didn't eat anything on the plane um, and my mother saw a, a can of coke and it was really interesting that it was that point that she realized that we were free because when the Americans came to Vietnam they brought with them military, but also Coca-Cola. And it was a very expensive drink, and we could own, and my parents only had it during the Lunar New Year festivities. But when the war ended and there was pure communism, there was no more Coca-Cola. She never saw it again. And she only saw it again on the Qantas plane. And when she saw the can of Coke, she just realized that we were really going to be safe. And she just sobbed as though she had never sobbed for, you know, 10 years. Um, and that, that, imagine that campaign for Coca-Cola. Wouldn't that just be, <laughs> asylum seeker freedom, Coca-Cola, drink up, people. <laughs> Is, <laughs> don't, don't give them any ideas. Um, Is so that we, what's wrong with the world? <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong? Yeah. So we arrived in Australia mm. and we went to Villawood. And of course, as mm. Mary said, it was incredibly different climate it was a reception center we were hosted and we weren't imprisoned Um, and people were kind Um, people St Vincent de Paul random volunteers Mm -hmm. that we we can't name now Mm -hmm. they they gave us clothing they they gave us the first black and white tv that we had they 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 helped us to you know teach English Mm -hmm. and I think we've got better at that over the years yeah the what we have now, the settlement services we have now, really owe their genesis to that period um, and to the large volume of people coming in all of a sudden. One of the interesting things about settling all of the unaccompanied children is that they originally had the idea of placing them in homes. Mm. And what's ironic and interesting is that I I went through a similar experience um, when we fostered a family from Cambodia 10 years after this in 1989 Um, and Ron and I originally had the idea that we would take this young girl who we call our adoptive daughter to live with us. She lasted two weekends and we realised that she was so fragile this kid, she was so so thin and I just thought this she we we realised she didn't need any more stress in her life and she needed to be with whatever family she mm. had supported with that family yes um to be able to eat what they wanted to eat you know you're talking about the meat and three veg no in Villawood. stress <laughs> that's stressful you know yeah. if you want lemongrass if you want 
Whatever. Because because no? that's familiarity. Yeah. You know, it, it's my, we jokingly say that the reason why we Villawood was fantastic. I mean, we had a home. People looked after mm. us, and the only reason why they left because the food was meat and free veg every day, yeah. and they needed fish sauce, and they needed to yeah. find some spice. Mm. But you know, I mean, it, superficially, mm. it's just about your yeah. palate, but it's not. It's about oh. home. It's about comfort. It's about familiarity. Yeah. The only thing that's identifiable yeah. in this strange land where you are a mm. mute, you are mute. So yeah, yeah, and and you know we we struggle to to build a life in in mm. Australia. So one of the interesting things that I again find uh, a, a typical story is the pressure that was put on you, and I think probably on your older brother as mm. well to be the the mouth of your parents. Yes. Um, the stories I've heard over the years of children being brought into to interpret for mothers and fathers in hospital situations yeah. totally inappropriate yeah. to have this little child having to interpret you know whether it's issues relating um, to genitalia sex. and yes. sex of the, of the you know the worst example I ever had was in a little little Iranian girl who had to go and negotiate an abortion for her mother mm. who'd fallen pregnant after being re- reunited with the father and they just couldn't cope with another child. Um, yeah. Imagine that what that would do to a child. So yeah, I'm, I'm here. This talk that a little happened to me. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, I mean, I, at the beginning, I said that you know this story is is so common for migrants and refugees, and and as children, we we must do that because our parents, my parents, didn't know the system. You know, everything, and especially my fam, my dad with his re-education experience every time he saw a uniform he was put into trauma of some sort you know whether it was just a parking officer i'm like that guy's the local council guy freak out freak out right but he, so his first introduction to australia had also <laughs> been a picture of this incredibly brutal man who was you know size 38 with with the tattoos, tattoos all over him and and that, that, well, we'll go back to that because that's sort of quite funny because we're in the camp. Finally, um, you know, we're getting accepted by Australia and um, the immigration official was in the camp and she said, here's a magazine um, about Australia and the first page is about a pub and there's this man in a, in a singlet, a blue singlet, a wife, beater. wife beater, it's a terrible word, Singlet, singlet and he was large and he had a beard and he was a truck driver and he had tattoos everywhere and my dad was petrified <laughs> and he said this is Australia and we're going there and so when we got to Villawood Jane my cousin um, her father was already in Australia they had left by boat so they had visited us and the first thing my dad asked was are Australian men really mean does it you know like that and go no no it's not like that they're really lovely they're nice people and like oh phew um, but on the translating thing, um, so many of these children do that and I went to every parent-teacher night for my younger brother, um, translating for my parents, hospitals, insurance companies um, and a whole bunch of other things that, that as a child, as an eight-year-old, I remember my mother had an accident. I was in the car with her and um, I was on the phone um, and she was sitting beside me, and we and we didn't. I don't think we had insurance at the time. And it was a small bump. And he was a real estate agent in in Bankstown, Ronnie's real estate agent. I remember I was in second grade, and I was my mum was talking to me. I said, "Let me deal with it, mum. Can we negotiate a hundred dollars? Is that going to be okay for you?" And he's his little pip squeak voice going, "Is a hundred dollars okay? Can we pay that? It's only a damaged light." And my mum's like, you know, freaking out, scared. And I said, it's okay, mum. And of course he's like, okay, $100 is fine. I said, $100 is fine. But what, what all those little instances indicate is that for these people, that is indignity. Mm-hmm. There is a, such a deep indignity in an adult having the expectations, mm-hmm. of, especially from patriarchal societies, where mm-hmm. this man who was an educated banker, yeah. French literate, working in a factory, having to rely on his six-year-old daughter Daughter. to navigate Mm. the world. So we come with an experience of trauma, Mm. then despite all the support structures, if there are any, um, the indignity of trying to navigate that for the rest of your life, you Mm. know, and you never, you never heal from, from all that and just keeps getting compounded Mm. and compounded. Mm. And so 
I think that if we are, if we know that already there is this indignity there, if we have the structures in place to minimise that, yeah. to allow connection to so they family, don't have to rely on exactly children. family, mm. community, you know, your tribe, to be able to connect mm. a self to all of those concentric circles to reduce the impact of indignity, then you can have a sense of hope that mm. if you try hard and you trust in society to look after you, then there's something worth working mm. for. There's something worth striving for. And that, you know, I think at that time in our family that was there so that when I studied hard and when I strived mm. and even when I fell down, I got back up because I believed yeah. I believed in possibility yeah. because we had yeah. that there. I think one of the things that comes out um, very strongly in the book is just how proud you were that how proud you are and were of the resilience of your parents and the respect that you held for them, yep. um, which is really testimony to, to their character and to yours. One of the passages that moved me, though, was um, a little reflection that I think uh, talks speaks to the culture clash that inevitably happens when you bring a child to a new country. Um, so as a six-year-old, she's losing her teeth for the first time. She, she goes to school and they tell her about the tooth fairy. So she goes home and religiously takes the tooth and puts it under her pillow, hoping that she'll get a coin there, but her parents don't understand. So of course, there's no money from the tooth fairy. And yeah. perhaps you could tell us about Santa Claus, because that's another thing. You know, you're told at school about Santa Claus, but did anybody bother to tell the parents? Did they bother Santa to tell exists, the parents? Santa exists, Mary. Don't you know? It what? Does. Santa exists. <laughs> well? Yeah. Um, <laughs> did he come? <laughs> um, Santa was actually quite global. So in Vietnam, people knew about Santa. So I remember my first Christmas and my mum was actually going, oh, look, there's Santa Claus. And I was straining to find out. But the tooth fairy never made it to Vietnam. <laughs> we don't. We have kitchen gods. We yeah. don't have tooth fairies. But um, And I kept that tooth for a very, very long time. <laughs> it still had the black you know, tartar, whatever that <laughs> accumulates. But I left it in my top drawer just in case mm. for many, many mm. years, actually. Mm. You speak eloquently of the weight of expectation from your parents as well. There's, uh, there's really no such thing as a free lunch, clearly. Um, you speak of your father saying when you came home, saying that you got 99% for what happened to the other 1%. Um, <laughs> Do you think sometimes when you've come from a family who have been in the elite that there is an expectation that in one generation you will go and resume, resume that position? Did, did you feel that? Yeah, um, I, think I, I think as a child I implicitly realised um, having witnessed all of the moments of indignity every single day in in our lives i implicitly knew what my duty was i knew that the only way out was education as the circuit breaker for for poverty and it and it still is and thank goodness right now knock on wood we still have a system where people who are in poverty and we were we were below the poverty line you know we were struggling very hard that can still go to university mm. i you know i implicitly knew that and when my dad He's this very typical stoic Asian unexpressive man. So, you know, 99, instead of saying, yay, good on you, it was like, well, where's the other 1%? And what's worse was when I was in high school, my first high school, uh, there were eight subjects. I came first in seven of them. And in the eighth one, I came second. And um, he's like, why do you get eight, the eight <laughs> subjects? But, you know, I mean, the pressure was there. Mm -hmm. They didn't necessarily have to, to say that, but I just, I just knew. And maybe it was just me. Maybe it was just me and my sense of maturity. Yeah. But I have to say that, you know, it's, I'm, I'm <clears throat> sitting here, I've got a double degree, you know, but it's almost the luck of the draw that it could have gone any other way. The way that we react as humans to, mm -hmm this indignity to pressure mm. to you know looking at society and know that we're we are a minority and we're, we're not 
represented in decision making. That has so many different impacts. And, you know, you all know Van Nguyen, the man that was executed at, in Singapore, right? Yeah. So he, he was born two days after me. Same, same, he was born on the 17th of August, 1980 in a Thai refugee camp. I was born on the 15th of August, 1980 in a Thai refugee camp. Now, you know, his, his family were educated as well. It's not, it's, it's not really about that. It's, it's, I just think it's that yeah. it can go either way. It's so <coughs> delicate. Mm. And if we don't invest yeah. enough. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, um, in your book, you touch fairly lightly on experiences of racism. Mm. Um, there are, I, I suppose, over, over a lifetime, inevitably, you have come across... Um, uh, some nasty opportunities, could uh, nasty experiences. Could you tell us a little bit about that period around the rise of Pauline Hanson? Oh, yeah. um, I've got to say just uh, one of the most touching um, parts of the book that again affected me because um, E.T. happens to be Ron's favourite, all-time favourite movie. Um, one of the nastiest jibes was yeah. that the two girls who yeah. said you they said um uh, uh, et got the message and went home yeah and i'm like and home is punch no, bowl what's the, what's the di- <laughs> what's i'm the, in punch what, bowl now what's the dif- what's the difference between et and an alien uh, yeah what, the what's the dif- difference between et and asians and asians yeah. et got the message and went home yeah i'm like mm-hmm. and it's that yeah. whole cronulla riots thing and you yeah. know it's just more manifested and um there is you know, I mean, throughout my life, there. I mean, my father ex- has also experienced, yeah. you know, racism. He was on the factory floor and they sabotaged his machine. Yeah. It was a multi-million dollar machine to try and get him fired, to taunt him. There was, there's institutional racism. There's all the superficial, you know, mm. name calling stuff. Yeah. Fine, you know, but I, I mean, what to say about it? Now that, now that I am grown and I have lived overseas, um, in Ho Chi Minh City, it's quite. There's a lot of different expats. My husband's Canadian. I've had a lot of discussions about about Canadian sociology and how different it is to Australia. What I have concluded now is that, you know, we 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 only dismantled the white Australia policy in 1975, right? And we 73. we 73. 73. Sorry. Yeah. We are, we are we still have this such this um, risk averse, fearful island mentality that and it actually I see in my corp I'm a corporate lawyer now I see in my corporate law work the investors okay I have a, there's an Australian Vietnamese Australian guy who's very successful he was um, he worked for Microsoft he did a couple of startups and he set up a fund. Um, and uh, he's, he said, I will never go to Australia to raise capital because the Australians are just so afraid of Asia and risk averse. So in mm. business, I just go to the, the, the States and they get it. They just get it. He was on the board of Telstra and so forth. And mm. if you reflect, if you reflect, that's the business circle. But if you f- reflect broadly, I, I think that we, we, uh, we have not been forced to negotiate difference. We don't border anybody, okay? And within our communities, this this fear of asylum seekers and migrants, it's it's now actually making us become recede in the way that we are thinking, and it's putting us on a back foot mm. because our younger generation are completely unprepared to navigate the cultural, economically complex landscape of the 21st century. I'm in a boardroom. Okay, doing an M&A deal, hundreds of millions of dollars. And the people who just do not have the skills are those who've grown up in homogenous societies. Mm. They just, they can't navigate, they mm. don't get it. And it's not enough to be literate in another language. Mm. It's the only way that Australia will be successful as a nation is actually if we are able to be empathetic, if we are able to be compassionate. And the only way we're able to be empathetic is to have a sense of humanity again, because we used to have it. 
And if we are able to be empathetic, we're able to, you know, go to Hong Kong, go to different parts of the world and actually be able to instinctually relate to another human being who is very different from us. And so if we think about, you know, where we are right now, it's not just about asylum seekers, you know, let them in, these leftist people. It's actually about the economic prosperity of this nation. Mm. And I can only hone this from my whole, you know, life, my parents, but also now having lived abroad and seeing that we're not actually going to do very well in the future. Sounds like an op-ed you should write. I think so. Mm. And I think I've, I've spoken enough. Um, I know that you've got people in the audience here who love you very much um, and who are very proud of you. I should just mention that amongst Tao's many achievements, she ended up um, working quite closely with the UN Human Rights Treaty Bodies um, and appearing, in fact, going to Geneva with Judy Cashmore uh, as part of the shadow reporting group on the for our review by the Committee on the Rights of the Child. But that wasn't her first time in um, before the UN either. Mm. In fact, you, you have quite, quite an impressive CV there. Thanks. Mm. Anyway, shall we open questions? Yes, I read. It's really nice to have you back, uh, as Mary said. I, how do you see the kind of particular decisions that governments make in terms of shaping the public discourse? Because when you look at um, the way the public discourse in Australia has shaped over you know, the last 13, 14 years, there are kind of very definitive vested interests that get promoted yeah. in the public discourse and issues such as you know the common humanity, compassion, care for environment, all of those issues and don't take this the wrong way because I know you're a corporate lawyer now. Yeah. But the privileging of commerce over yeah. you know all sorts of other issues yeah. Yeah. get downplayed. Yeah. So it's kind of I'm really interested yeah. to hear your perspective on yeah. that in terms of like the issues that you raised? Okay. Um, look, I've been living overseas. I get my news from, you know, Facebook and what's happening in Australia through, you know, certain follow people that I follow. Um, it's sad. It's just sad. The public discourse isn't brave. It's not courageous. It's, it's not actually becoming. Yes, what's really unfortunate is that it's so one-dimensional. This is not the way that the world is. And, and so, you know, the, these, all these issues, humanity, you know, economic prosperity, corporate, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. They're actually, they're, they're, they actually can be, a li there's a very clear link that can actually move things forward in a certain, in a certain way. And so... I, I, I feel very um, disappointed. I, every now and then there's, you know, some light from people like, you know, yourself and Mary and all the amazing work that you all are doing in this particular room. I'm, I'm very inspired by everybody here, by the way. This is, this is very intimidating to me. You're all doing amazing things. And, you know, people like Hugh Mackay. Um, but I just, I feel that... Um, what's been happening in the last few years in Australia is that things have just become very one-dimensional and we need to think beyond Australia in order to reflect on how on our place as a nation and how we move forward in the world you know when we're, we're probably going to move towards an economic recession at some point the, the linkages in the world right now free trade agreements trans-pacific partnership you know, and asylum seeker policy, it's all connected. Mm. But we're not brave enough in order to dig deep down to have these discussions to actually show there are really clear linkages. And so I, I, that's what I feel. I feel it's not courageous and I feel disappointed. I don't know what I can do except maybe, you know, have a, something small like this and, you know, hope that people can reflect. Mm. By the way, we have managed to secure some copies of this. So if the gentleman from co-op is still here yes it's at the back he's still there he doesn't yep. want to just give them away no, no. <laughs> I, I need to sign it yeah I will so any um, questions 
Yes. yes. I, I grew Chris. up in a mid-range um, Catholic high school in Queensland, and I count myself blessed that that school community was very multicultural. Uh, and when challenged with racism, mm. I always revert back to the friends that I had grown up with. Yes. From yeah. multi yes. cultural backgrounds. Mm. What does multi? What did multiculturalism mean to you as an immigrant child? And given what I consider to be a retrograde step that perhaps Australia had to have in relation to Pauline Hanson, what does multiculturalism mean to you and your family in Australia now? How do you view the differences? Okay, I think as a young child, multiculturalism was like Mufti Day. You know, and you come to school and you wear your traditional costume and you bring your food. Um, yeah. Which I had. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we all did, you know. And mm. it was really funny because the, um, like the Anglo-Australian kids, they wore shorts and, you know, they're like, well, what's mm. our traditional costume, mm. you know. Um, multiculturalism, I don't know when growing up, because um, I grew up in Bankstown, you know, city council, very 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 culturally diverse I was I felt actually safe you know there because so many so many people would were, were, were different I Although think I've got to say um, growing up very poor means that you do end up doing risky jobs that account towards the end of the book of you delivering the pizza <laughs> just had me on the edge of my chair yeah in the yeah, yeah, yeah. in the pitch dark yeah, yeah that's quite dangerous mm. I delivered pizza in the, the statistically most robbed street in Sydney <laughs> I remember I remember a current that's affair not the robbery I was worried about <laughs> I remember <laughs> a current affair actually doing a, a, yeah. a show on mm. about that particular street and there was no insurance company that would insure <laughs> anybody that lived on that street it was so awful no, <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Um, now it be, would probably be in Milpera, you'd say. Or Granville. Or Gran uh, oh, no, oh, no. no, Marylands Don't maybe. Don't say that about oh, Granville. Oh, sorry, Marylands. <laughs> um, multiculturalism, what does, it, what does it mean to our family? You know, I think that multiculturalism is about the, the opportunity to, to be in this country and, and to be validated. You know, to to actually be acknowledged and 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 celebrated, not just like you're there and you know you're sort of on the fringe and you're not an important part of society, but that you are uh, that you are part of this nation and you you clearly have um, something to to offer, and I think successful multiculturalism is when people don't ask. People don't say, you speak English so well, or yeah. where do you come from? And it's really interesting because I talked to my husband, you know, from Canada, and he grew up and, you know, I, he, saw, he saw people who are of Indian descent on TV and Asian descent on TV, and we're the same age. I never saw that growing up. Yeah. Why? And so I went and researched, does Canada have a longer colonial history than us? Do they have yes. a bigger population? Yes. Do they have the... No, not really. They're not like, you know... And so No, they what? were born bicultural for, st for starters. But they Don't have a forget French... forget the little French bit. But they have the French... But I think that that's really interesting because they have that French community there that, that they were forced to deal with. And you, discriminated. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's not pretend. Yeah. They discriminated. Mm. Yeah, and the, Abri you know, the Aboriginal people Mistakes. as well. But it's... You know, there's concrete things that I, think I can Canada compare. Canada is closer to New Zealand, yes, um, yeah, uh, relative to us than, and we are closer to the US mm. relative In to New Zealand. The, yeah. So, both Canada and New Zealand are just nicer countries. Mm. Although, <laughs> but not if you ask the indigenous people in Canada. Yeah, indigenous people everywhere. Deeply unhappy. Yeah, and, like, yeah. Let's not kind of valorize Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's not it, the it's, it's not relative, the most though. successful nation in, but yeah. com compared to just my personal experiences growing up and Tony's experience growing up, he just saw diversity on TV. Yeah. I didn't, sure. and mm. that 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 for me manifests mm. something, you know. Mm. But and, Chris and that going, links in yeah. with Chris's comments yeah. because children learn what they live and exactly they it. So live. I learnt yeah. I learnt growing up that I mm. wasn't validated. 
I learned that I don't see myself anywhere. Mm. I learned, I never, you know, one of the things that when I was writing at my writing desk in Vietnam about this book, I have a quote and I stick it on my wall and it's an Alice Walker quote. And it, and it, it was the reasons why she wrote. And it says something like, you know, I want to be able to read um, not what I want to, but what I ought to have been able to read. Mm. And I never read stuff like this, it, it, you know? Yeah. I read something the other day about someone who made a decision um, to, over one year, only read what coloured people, people had written. Mm. And because then you need the... writes about the diversity. Yeah. You get, yeah. Mm. So I don't know if that answers the question, Chris. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. There we are. Well, that brings us to two o'clock, uh, which is our usual witching hour. Um, okay. Next week, we'll all be back in class at this time. Um, <laughs> But, and you will no doubt be back at your desk, will you? Uh. Oh, never mind. <laughs> hey, you know, we'll... Yeah. I, I think I feel very blessed here that we have students like you and every semester, every year we start again and we learn, uh, we meet a whole bunch of new and amazing people. I want and I hope that your story, um, particularly relaunched through this place, is a message to everybody here that refugees are indeed welcome yes. and that we accept, we celebrate and we rejoice in the diversity that um, we have in the law school. So, thank you.